Uh, I'm not a super expert in doctor or anything else, uh, but this is a beginning uh, introduction to doctor. Um, who here has had a little bit of experience with doctor? Tell me about your experience with doctor. Um, we made our link with SCICD pipeline at the time, so we could like just even go test it and we had to know what it was like this. And then okay. like, respond to it and then we tagged it or whatnot. Mm -hmm. We had to publish it to cover doctor and then it was confirmed. That's cool. So you have a pretty good understanding of doctor and <laughs> And that. Uh, do you do DevOps or are you a developer? Or? Oh, I'm a developer. I did DevOps for many Okay, cool. Yeah, there's kind of a, a new, um, a new um, philosophy kind of came down from uh, Net, I guess it was Netflix. Uh, the idea that um, DevOps is now um, part or a role um, for developers. So it's nice to see that's coming. Now. So, uh, I've done um, development uh, for a number of years. I've done uh, hardware and software development. Uh, I've done conferences. I've done lots of different things. Um, so, for the last uh, 10, 11 uh, years, I guess. I was doing uh, hardware, software, firmware development, uh, and so I helped to uh, develop and test and build frameworks for uh, the very first um, SSDs, the very first, um, uh, you know, very first uh, PCI Express drives, and these are the same drives that you'll find with NASDAQ, you'll find them Facebook, you'll find some of them at Google, you'll find them all over the world. And um, and so we were pretty successful. We made that happen. Um, but in the process I learned a lot of you know, learned how to do a lot of automation and um, that's kind of what DevOps does. Uh, in DevOps we try to um, if we try to make uh, everything smoother. We try to release faster. And one of the ways that we can do that is with the use of Docker. So I want to talk a little bit about that and introduce that. So you've seen Docker before. Some of you. Um, this is kind of my agenda. I wanted to briefly uh, uh, introduce myself in DevOps. I've kind of already done that. Um, I'll skip kind of a lot of that and go directly to uh, some of the um, components of Docker and talk a little bit about that. So let's see. So one of the things that we're trying to do with this is um, increase the uh, the deployment frequency. So in other words, the number of times we release products and with um, Docker, there are a lot of companies out there that are releasing products um, and releasing updates and, and things, you know, 13, 14 times a day. And um, in, a, in a typical development environment that's really running really well, you might see, I don't know, a week or two weeks um, iterations between releases, and that's considered really great. Um, so you can imagine that if you can get to a pipeline delivery system that is going from developers' hands all the way to production, um, same day, or even multiple times of the same day, that's pretty amazing. And to get that through the whole process of testing and all of that, and so there's there's a lot of um, there's a lot of driving. Uh, technologies behind Docker. Um, we want to also increase automation. Docker enables us to avoid a lot of the hit files that we've had uh, in the past with um, software delivery. So one of those pitfalls has been the configuration management of machines. And we'll talk a little bit about that, why Docker does this a little bit, how Docker does this a little bit differently. 
and why that would possibly be just a little bit better. Um, we want to have shortened development cycles and fixes and kind of talk a little bit about that. Uh, we want to have faster recovery. So one of the things that can happen with, uh, with uh, DevOps and, and properly automated systems and properly developed systems, if we do it right, is that we can um, have a faster recovery. And if you have a DevOps engineer that's dedicated, well, one of the things that they're going to do is they're going to have an auto recovery feature. So if something bad happens, they can reverse it out um, in milliseconds. So, and all they need to know is, hey, something bad happens. Or sometimes you can even automate it to where it's, if something bad happens or something looks like something bad happens, then it automatically um, goes back to, the lead, to their uh, last known good. And they can do that very fast. And uh, so that's really, uh, you know, a promising technology is why I'm, I'm probably going to share a little too much about my experience with Docker. Um, a few years ago, um, you know, uh, I was deploying some applications with Docker, and one of the uh, one of the uh, fixes was to provide some DLLs for um, Open Office. And what happened is they increased the size of the image by, I think it was like a gigabyte. And my servers were very small, um, AWS servers, with very little space. And so you can imagine the tragedy that was about to befall. Um, we ran out of disk space, and it happened a lot after that. Uh, and so one of the things that you can do with Docker, if you design it well, is you can avoid some of these pitfalls. Yeah, you can include something that really you should never include something that has all of Office, and you should just include only the DLLs that you need. Um, but even so, uh, you know, if you're going to do that and you do it right, you'll design your, um, or you'll, you'll stop and say, hey, wait a minute, let's just make this part of of one of our slivers of our images, and I'll talk a little bit about that, and make it better. And so that's one of the pitfalls that I've had, um, and it's one of those things that I'm going to try to avoid. And hopefully, if you guys like this, maybe you'll talk to um, and talk to your development groups and say, "Hey, what about Doc?" You know, and maybe you'll be a little more confident asking those questions. Hopefully, if, if this goes well, then maybe I'll do another series with uh, a lot more in-depth things. We'll talk about, um, we'll talk about uh, Kubernetes, and we'll talk about deployment, things like that. Maybe that's maybe too far and too far above your head. Um, I know it's a little far even on my head to do that. Um, so I try to avoid uh, looking stupid in front of people. Um, but that's kind of how it goes most of the time for me. Uh, so we want better predictability, efficiency, security, and maintainability. Um, the, the, the web service, uh, well, I guess I should say first that Docker is intended for web services. It's not really intended to replace um, legacy <laughs> applications. You're not going to be replacing Microsoft Word. But if you design Microsoft Word really well, then maybe you're replacing some services that are dependent on the cloud, and you're replacing those with Docker images. Does that make sense? OK. So that's the idea. We want to have better predictability, better security. And um, I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, I also uh, just released my, it's terrible. I should tell you that right up, up front. But I, uh, I went out to um, LinkedIn and I released my uh, Docker for Beginners Linux Windows talk. So there's just a little bit more information in there. And obviously when I talk, I don't make a lot of sense. So um, if, <laughs> if you want to see that, um, you can go out to my LinkedIn account and look at that. And probably if you want that link, I can probably get with you and, and um, or you can friend me on on LinkedIn. Oh, okay. So, again, not perfect. Okay. 
has some um, exercises that you might want to do, follow through, to give you a little confidence with using uh, Docker. We'll go through it a little bit here, um, but that's kind of how it goes. So the three main um, components of Docker is this Docker daemon. Um, and of course, if we're talking about Windows, a uh, Docker daemon is, anybody? The service. It's a service. Yeah. So, daemon versus service, Linux term versus Windows term. Okay. Um, everything communicates through the REST API. And the REST API is nothing more than a set of uh, tools that you can access this server. So it's basically a client server design. The client, or I'm sorry, the server, the server is basically the service, the statement, if you're talking about Linux. Uh, and then the REST API is how you access that. And then the client is actually the Docker uh, CLI. So why is this powerful? Does anybody know? Do you know why this matters? Yeah, it pulls up the CLI. Exactly, yeah. You, you probably just, did you read my talk here? <laughs> it's pretty amazing. Yeah, that's, that's exactly it. That was my whole point. So hopefully uh, that makes sense to everyone. Does anybody have any questions so far? None? Anybody have any criticism so far? <laughs> yeah, your jokes are chill. Yeah, I have dad jokes. That's about all I got. So. Um, all right, does anybody know what a microservice is? A small service? Okay, that's a good, that's a good thing. Who would have thought it depends on just one function or is it 10,000 lines of code? Of it? it's, it's certainly smaller than traditional model. Yes. Yes. Uh, anybody else? More separation of concerns or whatever. Yeah. So it's supposed to be a little more isolated to a very specific function. Excellent. Any more? What do you, do you, have you guys heard the term microservice then? At least the buzzword, right? It's supposed to be more maintainable for the full day's work. So it's like breaks, it's supposed to be easier to fix. Yes. Yeah, that's the idea. And it kind of it came about as a result of, uh, of, of saying, hey, you know what? We've got this monolithic application, and this monolithic application is really hard to maintain. So here's, here's my problem. I've got this application that um, I have to test every single thing in the application before I can certify that application before it can go out. And if it's a big application, that's going to take months. And if it's a small application, you're going to throw as many fixes as you can and, and things into it. And you're going to go through as short a cycle as you can, which is still going to require a lot of QA. And there's a lot of things that you don't need to do. You don't need to retest if you have properly designed your application as a web service. So um, one of the things that that we, you know, seem to have a lot of questions about is how do I get to having a properly designed application um, that is uh, that is properly designed for Docker? Anybody ever wonder that? How do I get that? Right? So a properly designed one would be that we look at our application, we say, oh, how many pieces can I divide this up into? Boy, that, that increases a, a lot of complexity, doesn't it? So you've got a lot of complexity in, in an application when you start dividing it up into smaller and smaller chunks. However, those smaller and smaller chunks actually start to pay off. And the reason that they pay off is, again, you're not going to have to go through a whole process of certifying the entire application, your, your development cycle. If I know that all I'm doing is one thing in, when I'm developing for a particular application or a particular service, really, in this case, or a microservice in this case, if I'm doing something like that, then I know it's only going to touch certain things. I only have to test certain things. And now my unit testing is a lot simpler as well. 
so I can automate that portion out. And I love to automate. I love to automate everything that I possibly can and make it so that I don't have to test or somebody else doesn't have to test um, things. So you can eliminate your regression. You can eliminate all these things because regression tests, if you know what the, what the number one problem with regression tests are is that uh, it's hard to code for a regression test because it's really small and it's, it might affect other things. But if you really have a small service, then your regression test, you can write a lot of regression tests very quickly and, it, and um, the developer can actually take this role and build those. And um, I actually, I don't know if I've talked uh, about that before, but um, building regression tests, actually there's a lot of really neat tools out there, lints and all kinds of things that you can use um, now that allow you to uh, spoof data and make that process really awesome. So there's a lot of really cool stuff out there. Everything in this business is changing really fast. I mean, Docker came along pretty fast, um, and then now Docker is kind of um, uh, almost at a peak, and, and now everyone is trying to get into this possibility of, of making their systems faster and more competitive. So anyway, does anyone have any questions so far? Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> So if you were for microservices, would you do a single container for every service? Or is this part of that, the doctors that you're going to focus on the big service layers? Yeah. Would yeah. yeah. it be better to go that way, or is it better to have like yeah. containers you have to have you, can, you have to decide what you're going to do. But the design of Docker is such that um, when you create um, a Docker image, it starts with a Docker file. Um, and that's capital D. O-C-K-E-R-F-I-L-E, it's just a text file, and it's how you build your, your Docker image. And it has a very specific um, format. And it starts with a from statement. You make a reference, and the reference goes out to the web and pulls down um, base images like OSs and other things, and it, and it compiles them all together in a layered system. And each, one, each line in your Docker file um, which might be pulling down another uh, another pre-compiled uh, uh, Docker image file. You might just reference it. And if, as long as you're referencing it, you, and this is one of the things I was talking about, my big mistake years ago, not um, making a reference to a, another um, image file that would have saved me a lot of disk space that would have only had it once. Um, instead, I had it in the application layer, and I was downloading this gigabyte or 800 megabytes or whatever it was. And then I had to go in and throw in everything. That was a nightmare. So, but that's the idea: is is that everything is a layer, and um, in in those layers, you um, you have little slivers, and um, each one of these little slivers, when you update that sliver, and it recompiles, uh, and you and you re-upload uh, your image file to your repository, um, and this is a bit of terminology, like a a, a software engineer understands a repository, okay? Um, in Docker language, that's, uh, does anybody know what that is? A registry. A registry. So, Docker registry equals, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, code source repository. It's the same. So, except it's a binary. And binaries are not supposed to be stored. Right. My understanding that Docker accelerated the microservices movement because having deployed on monolithic systems before, mm -hmm. there's an overhead to deploying things. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's also that uh, there's the overhead of the release process. There's also the overhead of the virtual machine that things installed on. Mm -hmm. Given Docker's architecture, where you're not taking up n copies of an operating system and all that memory, mm -hmm. your resource load goes down. You can get all your dependencies on that one with Docker image and send that out. That it would have been, I think, it would have been very, very difficult to do a microservices architecture the way people do with one virtual machine for microservice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's that's probably true. I mean, I'm like I said, I'm no expert, so to be telling the gospel truth, and I would not know. But yeah, I think that's probably true. 
my question is, well, how good is the support for Windows now? Because I traditionally thought of Docker. That is a good question. So I was going to get into that a little bit later, but since you brought it up, I'm going to talk about it now. Um, I, I'm disappointed with uh, the uh, Docker Im implementation on Windows, and I've been disappointed with it for since it came out. Um, and, uh, so the idea that Docker has is that um, Docker Desktop is um, a, a development platform. It's not really a production platform. So that's important to remember. Unless it's running on the um, enterprise server version. And, um, and another thing that kind of is a misnomer is that, is that Windows um, Docker replaces Linux Docker. It's not true. It, it's not really true at all. You're, if you're using Windows Docker, you're going to be using Linux Docker, right? Uh, and the reason I say that is because there are services and things that just are more efficient on Linux, and they're always going to be that way. However, you're adding new things to your arsenal if you, um, if you use Windows, because now all of this .NET framework code and, and things it, and, and software products and dependencies that you've built into your a application can now be moved to the cloud in a Docker. And, um, and you're only, when you go out and you replace, just like to talk about the layers, when you go out and you replace a version of something, it's a sliver of an image. And it will just simply get updated um, on the server. And when you go to run your application, it doesn't re-download that whole thing. It only downloads the sliver piece that it needs, which is why it becomes extremely powerful. So what is the difference between uh, virtualization and Docker? That's always the number one question I get. Does anybody think they're the same? They're not the same. Okay. So traditionally, the virtual machine, you have an entire copy of the operating system for every machine you're emulating on the server. Mm -hmm. So if I have 128 processors and I take two, I got 64 copies of the operating system, mm -hmm. and that's going to chew up a lot of memory. Yeah. Docker gives you an opportunity to share one copy of the operating system, but still provide a secure container for your application so you're protected against what else is, else is running on that system. So there's a tremendous RAM savings mm -hmm. going on Docker. Yeah. So did everybody hear that and understand that? Is it okay if I say it in my own way? Okay. So with virtualization, um, and, and that was a good explanation. I'm not saying it's not good. It's an excellent explanation. Um, I'm going to say it in my own way so that um, I, in case anybody else is wondering what that means. Uh, so with virtualization, every single uh, operating system and every single application you have traditionally set, uh, uh, divided up into a separate instance of an OS. Uh, and, and I think probably the best... Uh, best way of, of communicating this poor design is to say it's kind of like looking at um, house, houses versus uh, apartments. So if you have an apartment and you, uh, you, I mean, I'm sorry, if you have a house, then you had to install electrical, you had to install bathrooms, and every house has uh, very particular things. It has a living room, and they all have they all have um, stairs, and they all have basements, and they all have um, all of these things that are overhead. And there's a lot of them. Um, and the difference, and the reason that apartments are cheaper, for the same reason that VMs versus Docker is going to be cheaper, is because you have uh, you have an apartment that shares electrical that shares shift stairs, that shares a lot of resources, the plumbing and all of those other things. So you're not having to replumb or plumb out to someone's house or these things over and over again. You've already got all of that up and they're temporary. So if you don't like it or if it's broken, 
you shut it down and you start another one in milliseconds. And one of the biggest problems that we have with OS, uh, OS is on VMs, is that at the very bare minimum, it's going to take about a minute to change over or add. Even if you've got it completely automated, it's really great, it's still going to take about a minute. And um, if, you've done, uh, if you've done your Docker Swarm or your, your Kubernetes network properly, uh, you've got something that is deployable, replaceable, um, uh, expandable in milliseconds. Literally, it is under a second in most cases uh, for most services to start a new one or expand your services and change the routing for all those services in milliseconds. And for web services, this is a really big deal. This is a really big plus for us. So um, who here has ever installed um, Docker? Okay, so you've installed Docker, you've installed it. What's your experience with Docker? Tell me. I heard that if you don't know it, you can not know you won't hire you. So I am not here. Whoa. Don't tell anybody who's hired me. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of true. It's, it's getting that way. Record, right? What's that? You're about record, right? No crap. I will know Docker in two hours. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, you kind of have to anymore. I, I kind of look at it this way. If you don't, if, if you don't at least understand a little bit about um, uh, PAAS or uh, web services or um, or uh, Docker or at least some form of containerization, then it's hard in this industry to move forward. Even if your job has nothing to do with it, it's like that's what they're going to ask you: is Do you know Docker? Well, I don't know what Docker. I, I don't know Docker, but I know what it does, and I have a little bit of experience. This is what I know because I li listen to some guy ramble on about Docker a little while ago. That might be just enough. <laughs> Hopefully it is. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, it, it's not really a traditional system. And one of the problems that I've encountered is that I have to deal with um, uh, IT personnel who have been doing IT for 20 years. And Docker is a really, really new concept. And the reason that it's new is because they're not used to the idea that um, there aren't these gates where you control everybody. Okay, in 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 a properly designed Docker, you're not you're not going to have the gates where I have to go out and um, uh, provision all of these servers and these resources, and I have to get uh, permission to provision and and do all these resources. No. <laughs> That's a bad idea. That wastes a lot of time, and it, it takes a lot more resources. It takes a lot more manpower, and it can't be automated very well because you've got to talk to somebody or you've got to fill out a request form, and there's time in between going back and forth. Well, if you automated this properly, then um, we do something called a lift and shift. You guys familiar with the term? So a lift and shift is where you take a legacy application, you dockerize it, so that you can deploy it in seconds and change it. It already gives you that benefit. You can already take your full gigantic um, application and throw it into a Docker, and you can throw it up on the web and um, or internal sites or whatever. You know, you don't have to throw it on the web. I'm not being judgmental or anything, but you don't have to. Um, but you can you can go and and you can do that, and you can already start using it. So. Uh, as long as you have somebody who understands the process. And it's really not that difficult. Um, and uh, it should be easier than it is, but it's not. Not yet. So, uh, so I, I did promise people that I would talk a little bit about Windows. Um, I would focus on Docker for Windows, um, which, you know, so far we haven't really done a lot of that, but um, we have a little bit. Not a lot. Uh, so the question that you had asked, I believe, was, um, you know, uh, how is Docker for Windows different, and do I like that better? Uh, like I said, 
I think there are some really bad things about it. Okay, and I'm going to tell you uh, some of the things that I hate. Uh, the first is that they, the Docker image setup, the default structure, uh, tries to put things in the user space. Okay, and if you're a Linux person, then you understand that you do about everything from the user space, and you're happy doing it that way. But in the Windows world, the user space is NTFS protected. It's shared. It's protected. You've got all this crap, and um, it's a really bad design. Plus, you don't know if the username has spaces in it. And Docker, I can tell you right now, if you have spaces in your username and you're trying to use Docker Desktop and do some programming, you're screwed. It's not going to work very well. And you're going to run into a ton of problems. Okay? And the second problem, the second really big gotcha with Windows is this, uh, if you're in a domain, two number one things <laughs> that um, everyone who uses Windows would complain about is, is, are those things. And so I don't know if anybody's ever figured out what the workaround is for it but me, so I'm pretty awesome. So, uh, but my workaround is to create um, a user group that I call Docker users if I'm in a domain, which I have been in a domain and I have had my, my machine locked down and trying to do development this way, and it's been a nightmare. And so what I did is um, I create... Uh, a group called Docker Users, and then I create a user that is a member of Docker Users, and then I log in with that user, and this is really weird, but you've got to do this, and then I go to my um, shared folder, as long as it doesn't have spaces in it, and, um, and I give access, full, complete access to that shared folder uh, for that particular new user that I got. Then, now going back, I go back and I log in as my domain user, so I'm no longer logged in as a local user using, uh, who was a member of, of that application and i would already given access and all of that. So, uh, access to the groups, uh, NTFS access to the groups, and then suddenly things work better. So, there's that. <laughs> all right, and then, the other thing is, is that, uh, so there's a couple of tools that you can use in Windows. I'm going to demonstrate just a little bit of the Windows tools. Um, and I think I'll just maybe, yeah, I'll probably just close this down just temporarily while we go and do that. But um, one of the, it has some pretty cool tools in Windows. Um, and it's really development centric. So I've told you the bad. Now I'm going to tell you the good. The good is that you have some GUIs, you have some things, and you don't have to sit there in the command line typing things all the time. And personally, I like doing things from the command line. I love it. It's great. But um, other people don't love it as much, um, especially .NET developers. They'd rather be inside the GUI or have things done inside their inside of, uh, Visual Studio or whatever, and there are lots of shortcuts in Visual Studio. In fact, um, and I'm not going to cover this, I'm not going to talk about it much, but if you have a Visual Studio project, there's actually an option from, I think it's uh, Visual Studio 2016 and above, that has a Docker option. And you can actually create an emergency. Okay. Um, the gods heard me talk. The Microsoft <laughs> So uh, you can actually create um, uh, Docker images directly from, uh, from uh, Visual Studio. It's pretty awesome because you can go out and edit that same file that it creates, which is just a Docker file or uh, a Docker Compose YAML file, one of the two. And, um, and you can go out and edit it, and you can still do Docker Compose and add features from there, and it just picks it up and adds them to it. It doesn't replace the file, so you don't end up with this file from hell that uh, when you change something, it's overwritten and now I'm screwed. It actually works pretty darn good. And it kind of also helps you out when, when it comes to figuring out what other dependent layers that you might need. So most of us, if we're using .NET, um, programming or .NET and um, Visual Studio. Uh, we have a lot of options, but most of us use like, like Microsoft Nano Server 
and then we might add like a Microsoft.net um, image. And um, so if I was doing a, a Docker file, it's just like really simple. It's a simple command. It just says from Microsoft slash nanoserver. So, um, and Microsoft slash, so uh, I guess I should probably say that a nano server is basically kind of the idea of having an OS. So um, it gives you the OS files that are dependent. The kernel comes from the OS uh, in Docker, which is different from virtualization where you literally have new kernels every time. But the, the kernel comes from, from the OS, but the OS files that you're actually running, um, those come from the image. And when you, uh, when you uh, start Docker, when you, when, you can make it do specific things, but when you start it, it looks at the kernel and automatically pulls the right image for you. So it'll pull the dependent image. You still don't have to worry about configuration management, which is really good. Um, and the same thing is true of all the distros for Linux. So when you go to uh, add your little from and it goes and it goes out to the to the um, repo and it says, oh, pull this pull this uh, image file down. This OS image file down. Even though it's not the OS, it's just some files. Uh, when it pulls it down, it pulls down the right version for the kernel that you're using. It knows that. So, all right. So. In Windows, we like to use PowerShell, and uh, personally, I'm a huge fan of PowerShell. I've done uh, Visual Basic, I've done .NET, I've done C Sharp, uh, I've done C, C++, not a lot, but little, um, and I've done Python, and I've done Ruby, and uh, I can tell you that I love PowerShell, and PowerShell now runs just about everywhere. And so you can kind of make things work, and you can you can actually use the .NET Core uh, even in Linux, which is really nice. And from I, I haven't personally had a lot of experience with that, but from the people that I've talked to who are doing that, they're like, it works. It, I haven't had any problems, and I'm sure they're lying, but uh, they tell me that they haven't had any problems, and so. Um, I think that's pretty awesome. So this is the this is the setup. You'll notice that you need this um, uh, NuGet minimum version. So uh, in Windows, when you want to um, install things, uh, Microsoft likes to do this thing with NuGet. So this is why you have this command. So each one of these is a um, package command for installing, uh, and this particular one is for the server. Uh, for installing the enterprise version of Docker. So that's that's one thing. Um, I'm going to pull it out, but I don't know if you guys really care. It's going to be in that document. And it's already there, so maybe I'll just say that's what I would have typed. Actually, I wouldn't have typed it. I would have just copied and pasted it because I'm really easy. But then uh, the next thing you do is you put in your Docker uh, MSFT provider. I have no idea why this module is necessary, but it is. Uh, and then you do the Docker pro, um, uh, from the uh, module package and do a force. And uh, I found that I do have to use force. So just so you know, these commands are here for a reason. That's why I did it. So uh, and then and then um, there's also this restart that's required. So make sure you do a restart in between. So if you're doing like a provisioning app or you're doing some coding, you're going to have to plan for that. So it does have to restart. So this works for server. It also works for um, desktop. And the other thing that you can do is, uh, have you guys ever used Choco? You're not supposed to use Choco on servers. But I do all the time when I'm doing testing. So. Uh, but, uh, you know, because it's not very secure. Uh, but I use Choco a lot on my desktop. Um, and you can go out to chocolatey.com or whatever, or org, I, I don't know which one it is. Uh, but you can go out to there and you can pull down Choco, or you can just use, I've got a little, uh, a little, 
uh, power, either a PowerShell script or MS-DOS script to um, automatically install Chaco. And then Chaco also will do all these things for you too. Um, and the cool thing is uh, if you do like a Chaco search from the command line, you can do a search for uh, other Docker utilities and they've already figured out how to install it and you can automate it so they don't have to, you know, on your desktop, your developer machine, you can automate it and it makes it a lot easier. Just so you know. Um, so the, some of the tools that I'm going to be using today, uh, that's how I did it. But um, for like the server, this is kind of useful. Let's see. All right, so let's say you've gone through the installation. I'm going to assume that everybody here is proficient and can do an installation on their own, all that. Yeah, I'm pretty offensive. So uh, you'll get this little icon here once you're done, a uh, little Docker, Docker desktop icon. Uh, you would normally have that icon. It's now not there. Interesting. Okay. Maybe it's crashed. Okay, so here's the Docker desktop app. And remember that when you install the Docker desktop app, you may want to install or probably will automatically install uh, the Docker CLI. It's also a necessary por portion of it. And um, so on Windows, it now supports the ability to natively do um, Docker for Windows Dockers, which use the Windows kernel and or a Linux kernel, a default, Windows, a default Linux kernel, which is really, really nice. Um, and uh, But it does require um, Windows 10 Pro uh, because it uses hypervisor for the Linux side. It doesn't use it for the Windows side, but it does use it for the, obviously you don't have a kernel. So that's what it does. Um, and then you get this nice little Docker is starting here, so I'll wait. But you get this nice little icon, and when you right click on it, you get all these options. Um, and the first time you log in, it's going to have you either create a, a Docker user. And it gets a little bit confusing for people because Docker interchanges between uh, GitHub and uh, Docker Hub. And you need to have separate logins for both. So right here, this is Docker Hub. So, and you, it, but you're probably going to get prompted for the GitHub at some point too. So when you first load it, um, and that means you know if you come into settings or anything else, you're going to do that. But you also notice this ability to change to the Windows containers, so you can switch between two, the two, which is really really nice. Um, and if I hit uh, if I hit switch here, then it would take me probably about 10 minutes. <laughs> it takes a long time. It doesn't quite take 10 minutes, but it's not really good for a, a demo to show you that. I might, but I'll probably have to get really long-winded in between. So um, there's this new tool and utility called Typematic. Has anybody ever used this so far? You've used it. Ah. Darn, it's open that I could just introduce something totally new. It's been around for like a year, so so you know it's not like that new. But so it's called Typematic. The first time that you try to load it, what will happen is a it'll try to have you log into you know wherever, but b it'll also prompt you and say, hey, you got to download these particular files, and it'll give you a web address that it'll click it's clickable, and it'll have a little place um, in the uh, message window that'll tell you. Um, where to put the files. Pay attention to that. That's the one thing that you've got to pay attention to. And also notice that when you unzip the files, because it downloads a zip file, the zip name is not the same as the directory name, so you just have to create the directory structure and then unzip the files to the root of that folder, and that's how that goes. And then you get this lovely uh, Kitematic screen, which is nice because Let's say I want to run some services that are just default. Um, I want to test it out. I want to learn a little bit about Docker. Well, what I can do is I can just come in here and I say, ah, create uh, Jenkins. That'll be awesome. Okay, you know, everybody used Jenkins before? Let's say I want to use, uh, it's, it's just an automation utility. It's 
It's a web service um, that you can install. Uh, has this uh, when it first goes, it, you get this lovely little key that you have to um, copy and paste into the place. And so, uh, let's see if it comes up here. All right. So, what's cool is, yeah, I could go out to a command line and I can type in Docker. Um, space inspect space and then whatever docker image this downloaded to which probably is going to be called Jenkins probably do inspect Jenkins then it would tell me all the information that I'm going to see if I just click right here I got all that information right there not only that but I also have um, ports so uh, when docker creates a service and really like I said in the beginning docker is about web services it's it's about that it's not about replacing applications. So when I come in here, I can go to a publish a local post, which is published to this, this internal um, uh, port that goes to uh, a doc, the Docker port on the inside of that Docker image. So there is a little translation in between. It's just a little web server on the front that says, oh, we'll translate this to this. And that's it. Okay. So if I, if you can actually click right here, and it'll take you right into it. Oh, look at that. And that lovely little password, Gary, that's not my password, is there. And no, I don't want to really do that. No. Now it's going to set up uh, Jenkins for me. Do you see how fast that was? That's like, I didn't have to figure out anything. And not only that, but this is the Linux version. And I'm running on Windows. Pretty cool. So the only problem that I have is I can't run them at the same time, which is a new feature that they're working on. Which would be really awesome. You can run Docker. It when your manifest says, "Oh, look, I can I can either use this side of the manifest or this side of the manifest." And the manifest is just a file that's contained on the uh, Docker repository um, that tells it what <laughs> OS that image goes with. Okay. Would you want to take Linux or Windows to do with it? Very well stacked. No. No. And in fact, most of us who are configuring this in large organizations are not using that at all. What we're doing is we're we're um, we're setting up like a uh, a swarm, or we're setting up a Kubernetes stack, and um, and we're um, making a couple of masters. And um, one will be for Windows, one will be for Linux, and then we'll um, we'll link them together. So if if you look at it in, in you know your little web interface, it'll show them. Oh look, I've got a Windows Windows chain and I've got a Linux chain, and they're all part of this master server. So it works great. Okay. This right here actually never happens, so I don't know. <laughs> How big or complex does your system need to get before you need to be using Swarm or Kubernetes? I mean, if you have one microservice you want to deploy, would you start with that, or you wait till you got like ten servers on the microservices? All right. So if you do click on this link that he's going to give you, he's going to post. There's actually another link under mine that talks about that exact thing: when to use Kubernetes versus um, Swarm. And I talk a little bit about that. But I'm going to save you all the reading that you ever needed to do, and I'm just going to tell you simply that Swarm is great for 50, say, um, images versus um, anything larger. Uh, Swarm is good for small mom and pop, but you're going to find that everything that you automate in Swarm it is not compatible with your automation in um, Kubernetes. Given that, it's better to start with Kubernetes. But also remember that Kubernetes is a lot more complex, more feature rich, definitely, and really reliable and really easy to manage once you've got it. But it's much more complex. Um, it's built for a really big system. And um, they have a mini coop. Uh, that's what I call it. It's just Kubernetes, a little small version. Um, and you can run that on your desktop and things like that. And you can get a lot of the benefits that it, a lot of the smaller stuff and, and it makes it easier to configure and less complex if you want to do that on your desktop. 
uh, or in a server environment, you can do stuff like that. And I've actually used that for um, clients before. I've set that up for um, uh, for uh, FedEx, uh, FedEx Home, or FedEx, what is it? Where's the FedEx? There's two divisions of FedEx. What is it? It's like FedEx. It's FedEx it's Round. That's right. Okay, so it was FedEx Round. So I set up a little bit like that because they just, they have a bunch of readers that they're using to um, uh, scan packages and try to find where those packages, they have all this really cool software that goes out and guesses where that, pro that, that package went from. And FedEx is the only company right now that actually tries to get you your package when it gets lost or when the label gets lost and other things. It's a good reason to stick with FedEx. I'm not trying to plug in for FedEx. I don't work for FedEx, but I'm just saying that's pretty much better, you know. So, but that's that's how it goes. Um, that's really the only reason to do that. And I wasn't expecting it to error, actually. I feel embarrassed. So, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to show you another feature. This is really pretty cool. So I have two versions here. Um, if I want to stop the service, I can do that. Nice. And if I want to delete that service, I can just remove it from here. I don't have to do it from the command line. It's also nice. Uh, and let's say I want to do this again. I've apparently done this with Jen Jenkins before. I have another image on there. Maybe they're conflicting. I don't know. So I'm just going to remove it and I'm going to recreate it. And here we go. It was that fast. Um, you'll also notice that when you've got an image downloaded once, you don't have to re-download it. There's a caching system. It's really nice to take advantage of. Um, so here's the um, password, the temporary password that everyone loves. A little hash, the default. So we'll go over here to ports, and I don't know if it's done, but I'm going to try it, see what happens. Oh, it is done. It's pretty fast. Come in here, and same thing happened. You know, this always happens when you try to demo something. I mean, this has probably never happened to me before. So that's, you know, very promising. It could be that I, I was using, um, I was do, doing this demo through remote desktop before, and so maybe there's some difference. And again, it's probably that stupid design of putting, um, putting all the Docker files inside the user space, which is just stupid. Ah, I complain. Okay, so maybe it's come back, maybe it hasn't. Ah. We're offline. Skip plugins. Yeah, let's do that. Let's create a username and user. L O S E R. Okay, got it. Save and finish. All right, I can start using Jenkins. I think. Yeah, yeah, I can. That's pretty cool. All right. Uh, so, whoop, I mean, I'm logged in as loser. That's cool. So I can start using this immediately. Okay. So what's the first thing that you notice that it, that is is going to be a problem for um, Docker versus um, traditional virtualization? And the second this the, the second I kill this. I've lost all of the settings. I've lost the users. It's going to be as if it's new. When I download a new image or start a new container, even if it's the same uh, image, the new container is going to be totally different. So what you can do, again, in Pipematic, is I can say, ah, you know what? I like, I like to have volumes, and I think I'm just going to use a, um, you know, I'm going to change the volume here. And I'm just going to put it right here. Nah, maybe I'll put it in a new folder called loser. 
I'll save that here because that's my loser account. And you'll also notice that it does this really cool thing with the local folder. So one of the things that you run into all the time is uh, how does how how when I when I do map things and you're going to want to map things from the command line sometimes you're going to want to automate. How do I get that um, correct mount point? You know, this does it for you, so it's kind of nice. You can just come in here and you can replicate it. Just copy and paste this new line here. So. And so you can just add it to your automation. Hey, it's always going to be like that. Pretty easy. Now, I have a folder that is, that is the Jenkins folder for this application sitting on my file. So the next time I bring this up, if I kill this image, and I can come in here and I can reconfigure it for the same folder and it's not going to replace the files and I'm going to boot it up and it's going to be a brand new instance of that of that server but I won't have lost any of the data. So that's kind of nice. Uh, so here's, here's the downside of the Windows testing and things like that is again this is what I was talking about when you go to run uh, on Windows and Windows containers and or Linux containers, this is the number one problem people have is the mount points. So uh, you can mount this way or um, if it's a server, you're probably not going to mount locally, thank goodness. You're probably going to mount to um, a, like an NFS share or an SMB share or something else, you're, or uh, uh, you're going to mount to a web uh, address, which is probably going to be like, you know, uh, a W, I mean, sorry, uh, an S3, or uh, if it's Azure, it's going to be like an Azure mount point, which is, you know, they have their own unique way of doing that. So you can do that, and you can say, you can have all the backups and everything taken care of, and you don't have to worry about the application layer anymore. The application layer, this will run the same every single time with the same bits, the same data, for the same version every single time, and I never ever have to worry about the configuration of the server itself. I never have to worry about dependencies. I never have to worry about um, uh, doing um, uh, upgrades and uh, and you know getting the latest um, uh, security fixes and all of that. I can do that independent of the application. So I can go out and say, I've got one that's already running. That's great. I'm going to go out and I'm going to hit my server which in which I've already replaced all the dependent files and it's going to pull in the right sliver. It's not going to replace the whole sliver. It's not going to replace all the files. It's not going to replace all the images. It's only going to replace the files that I need for my upgrade and in a millisecond, I'm going to switch over from the one that doesn't work to the one that does, or from the one that doesn't that has the out of date um, uh, security holes to the one that has the updated um, uh, version. So that's another reason why it's super awesome. So that's really cool. And then we can see. Let's. Uh, it has to reload when you do that, so let's see if uh, if it makes me re-log in. Oh, I totally toasted it. Nice. So, like I said, this is the problem I've had mostly with it on Windows, is this stupid mount point, and like I said, most of it comes from the stupid um, directory structure. So, uh, I'm probably not going to get into too much. I'm going to I'm going to provide the article, um, and you can download that, or you can look at it on my um, LinkedIn account, uh, and you can look at all the uh, exercises that I've got there. Some are good, some are bad. Some only work on Linux. Some will, and you'll discover that. And you'll also notice that um, I put like a slash, which in Linux language in my um, is just a carriage return, just so you know. If you're doing it, you might have to remove the slash and make it all one line instead of, you know, nicely formatted in multiple lines. So just a little heads up there. I did not in include that in the document. I just assume people know that, and that's probably a really bad assumption. So, all right. So I want to show you the other thing, the Docker CLI. Boom. 
let's say I want to um, start coding, or I want to start using the, the uh, CLI, or I want to create an image um, and upload it to my, uh, my Docker repository, right there. And all the tools are already loaded up, and I can even automate or run scripts, or I can have it run scripts when I start it. I can do all kinds of things from here, which is really nice. So you get that. Uh, you can also look at the network. Um, so you can see this one's bridged, and it's probably not actually connected to the internet. And so that's another thing that kind of becomes a problem here in, that, in there with Windows. Um, you have to um, do Google searches a little bit here and there to fix your bridge so that the IP address translates and you can actually see servers outside of your local machine. So that's kind of a pain. Um, but other than that, it's pretty much all the same as, as Linux. And in fact, I think um, this... Uh, this application, I haven't tried it, but I think it will also run in, in on Linux as well, so if you like it. And also the Docker CLI using PowerShell also runs on Linux as well. So you can use the same scripts for the most part between the two, which is nice. Um, again, I can stop, I can restart, I can actually hit the docs. So if I want to learn about uh, this particular image, I can see the Docker command. So if I ran this from the command line, this is essentially what it's running. And I can also include new things in there too. Like um, if I want to, I can copy this and come out to a command line and I can go like this. And then I can start adding on other commands. Um, so I can do a Docker pull or a, a Docker um, run. So Docker pull. You can do docker pull and just pull down the image first. So if I did this command, actually let's show you the... No, I can't. I'm sorry. I can't do that. I love doing that to my kids. It's awesome. I'm the worst father ever. Hmm, that's nice. I didn't know you could do that. Ah, I thought you could increase the size of your command prompt that way. Maybe it's just the other version I have. Let's see. Let's change the font to 24. Let's see what happens. Oh, cool. That worked. Okay. All right, these are the commands. You can always do, you know, uh, a Docker uh, space dash dash help like everything else in Linux. So that's pretty good standard stuff. Uh, so um, you can do the security, your TSL security and PIMS and all of that. I don't ever use that. So unless I'm automating something that's big and in a secure structure. So most of the stuff that you're going to use is probably down here and really probably in these commands. So they're actually the closest to the, um, uh, to the command prompt when you're done. And these are probably the only ones that you're going to want to know and use. But I will tell you a couple of these um, that are kind of use, useful. Um, you can manage your Docker config. So you can, um, you can set up user accounts and other things like you would in other, uh, you know, other like utilities. Uh, you can come down and use Swarm. We'll talk a little bit about Swarm and Kubernetes. Swarm is the same as Kubernetes, in case you didn't know, for um, managing more than one image and all the network traffic and routing and all those things. You can do that with, with Swarm from the command line. It's really great. Um, but you can also do it from Kubernetes. So, but this, this, what Kubernetes does in the background is actually call these functions. It does the same thing. It just, it's just that, um, and this is why it has a CLI. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, you know, the, the built-in design is so that you can have other products that overlay Docker and communicate through the Docker way, but expand that out to include all kinds of other features that they didn't think of. So it does that and it builds it all in for you. It's really nice. 
It's great for automation, those kinds of things. But again, this is pretty much most of what you're going to be using. You're going to be using Inspect a lot because that gives you a, let me show you Inspect. Boom. It's just a JSON file, essentially, with all the trimmings here. Gives you all your mount points. If you needed to know the IP address of your of the internal server so that it could be hit from um, outside of your desktop, then you could use that here. Uh, so by default, the desktop has access to the internal access, but but um, not external access. So you have to kind of do some investigative stuff to make that work. But it's cool. Works. I'll get back to the GUI because that's probably the most important. And I'll, uh, let's see, oh, taking a lot of time. Okay, so uh, we've gone over the host name and ports. So you can set those up here. Um, and so if I wanted to, I could take this Jenkins server and I could say, oh, um, make a make port 8080 the same as some other port here and it would work. Um, when you start, it automatically should change that. So I'm going to come out of here, come back in. Yeah, so you can see the ports are now mapped. Uh, volumes, it knows where the volume is for the losers there. And then the bridge again. Uh, and then you have some advanced things like uh, you can um, you can allocate um, you know other connections to your containers here, uh, but mo for the most part, this is intended for developers and intended for doing development with this, and for people who just I don't want to learn a whole command interface. I just want to make it work, and this will do that for you. Make it work. So you can start using Docker tonight if you want. You can go out and you can install it. You can make sure you install the Docker GUI, Docker Desktop, is what it's called. But um, and you can do a search on the web for it, or you can do any of those other methods that I gave you. Um, and then you can set up all these other things. Um, so it's kind of nice. Uh, and you can also hit this configuration here, um, and you can set up. Uh, so you don't have to use. A hypervisor, uh, you can actually tell it to use, uh, if you're familiar with it, VirtualBox, but you do have to install VirtualBox. So um, anybody not familiar with VirtualBox? You ever run VirtualBox on your machine? You haven't? Okay, well, that's good then. Um, so VirtualBox is like a hypervisor, only it's like a hypervisor version 2. It's not the version 1 where you can share more hypervisors. You can have something on top of something on top of something. It's one level deep. Um, meaning, but you can still run 64-bit applications and more importantly for us, uh, it will automatically load um, when you hit the configure, uh, Docker configure. It'll automatically um, download and load a, um, a uh, image file for you. So you'll have an OS kernel. That's the only time you really have to worry about it but that'll give you an OS kernel and it'll run in the background and then everything will reference that OS kernel and you don't have to replace it all the time. It's just going to use the same one, same desktop. It's not going to have any problems with that. And, it's, and the Docker um, server is going to communicate for you. You don't have to worry about any of that. It's just going to be all behind the covers and it's just going to work. So, and I've never had a problem with it. It always works for me. So, and I'm, I've been honest with you. I've told you what I think is bad and what I think is good with Docker, right? I've been completely 100% honest with you. What I think is good and uh, also all the things that I think are poorly designed and I wish they would redesign. So, all right. Uh, I know I've gone a little bit over, but what kind of questions do you guys have? So. You talk about you can transfer over like an old setting to a security fix. How would it look like if you uh, update Jenkins for the kind of security patch or something? Do you make a new container and you point to that? Yeah. So uh, that's a really good question, and it's a more advanced question too. 
Uh, what he does is how, you know, we, we talked about this ability to take um, that uh, a Docker, when you do Docker um, build, it goes out to a Docker file, file, um, it's named Docker file, and it's just in a directory, and it has some commands, and they're really simple. There's just, you know, from uh, copy and execute. So it copies files from one place to another. It um, it uh, executes when it gets done. If you want to execute something, like if you want to pull up a, if you want to run your website, or if you want to do all those things, you can just add those little commands right there. And it's recommended, by the way, that you add them all together on the same run line, because otherwise it used to, I'm not sure if it still does that, but it used to create a separate, um, uh, a separate layer in your image. Okay, so what his question was, is that how do I replace the layer in one of my image files? So when I create an image of an OS or my application, which is just you know copying files over and it creates a little image file and then I run that image file. Um, when you do that, uh, you you can actually update your image file on the network server and it only replaces that switch. So when you run it on in when the production version is run and it pulls it from the same place. So it goes out to the server, it says, give me the latest files, and it says, ah, oh, there is a difference here. I just replaced this one little sliver. The other parts don't get replaced. Um, and so it saves a lot of space. And it also makes it so that you don't have to recompile everything. You don't have to worry about that. You'll figure it out and do it for you. Similar to point question. So if you have version one of your microservice, and suppose there are some data files that's not hooked to a database, but there's some data there it needs to persist when you upgrade. Mm -hmm. You want to deploy version two now. By doing that mounting that you showed, the files go there and they will not be overwritten when I up update my use. So, okay. If there if your database is a file system database, then yes, that's true. But in the most cases, your database is going to be like a network access, um, and it's going to be a database server. And this might be a case where I really do want to run a VM, or maybe I don't. Maybe maybe I don't need that. Maybe I've got enough resources on on the system. And by the way, Docker handles the resources really really well. It's very very nice because with a with a VM, you're loading all of the resources for that OS. So you're using all the memory, and you have to use a certain amount of memory. There's no way to get around that. With Docker, you can actually share the memory with the OS that you're on the host OS. So it's really nice. Um, but now I've lost my train of thought. Where are I was going? Okay. If I'm not using a database for my persistence because it's a small amount of data, just a, just a JSON file or something, mm -hmm. how do I upgrade my microservice without overriding that JSON file? Okay, so there's a dash B. Um, the dash V command, in fact, if you look at this, this is what I was saying before, um, with your volumes, your dash V command will be just dash V, and then you'll have this directory, which is your home directory inside your image, which is where your copy, you copied your files to, with the copy command, CLPY space, um, local files that you just compiled for your application, space, inside directory, var Jenkins home, okay? So, um, and then you just do uh, dash V for volume, and then you just say uh, slash var Jenkins home, colon, backslash host, C colon, backslash temp, backslash um, Docker Lisa. Boom, it sets it up. And you can automate that to where you all get the same directory. And if, you're, if you've got a really great system, most of the developers are never going to use this. But if, if you're um, worried about doing it on your, um, uh, your, uh, your uh, customer facing side and things like that, then it's probably going to be like a, an FS share or like I said, going to be some kind of um, web host or um, cloud host or something like that. So, but it, and they have their very own structures, and I don't know them by heart, honestly. 
I actually, every single time I have to do like a Google search or DuckDuckGo <coughs> search. Yeah? Could you go over a step by step like deploying a simple website? Or would that take too long? Uh, I do not have a website downloaded right now uh, on this system. Uh, it, my source code is on a different drive. Uh, but uh, if we schedule it, I would be happy to do a demo um, for the next the next course. Would that be good? And there's also a, an example in my uh, document too of that, I believe. So, no, but it, I wrote it like three or four months ago, and it's probably just barely okay. So just so you know, it's not very much. Um, but I, I think that I do have one in there. So, and if I don't, I can probably add one and upload it to like somewhere. Any more? Did have a container with the hello world that we can pull up? Yeah. Yeah, they have one. Yeah. In fact, let's do it from the command line. Um, I believe this is it. Yeah. There you go. Hello world. And the Microsoft side has the same. So you just do Microsoft. So if I, if I did that thing where I said I could, I could come down here and say um, switch to Windows containers, I could run the Microsoft version right after that. But like I said, it takes like, I don't know how long. I, I haven't timed it, but it's really annoying for me to go back and forth. So sometimes I'll set up separate um, machines just so I don't have to do that, so I can test them both at the same time. But so, and like I said, you know, just in conclusion, uh, I think Docker is a really great product. I think that it has a lot of things that I don't like about it. Uh, I think that if you're going to do Docker, understand that, yeah, I'm going to do a little bit of Linux with it. Uh, it's not unlikely that I'm going to have to learn a little bit of that. And Linux is not hard on Docker. Linux is really pretty easy. There, are, you just you literally copy and paste commands from from your web search to do things, and it's amazing how easy. <laughs> I mean, I feel like I, I feel like a scam artist every time I use it. Cause, like, geez, I don't know any of these commands. I, they don't stick in my brain for very long, and and I don't use them every day. So. Uh, even though I do actually do Linux and have actually done a lot with Linux, I don't remember that stuff all the time because I'm mostly using Windows right now. And so it's just really pretty easy to just do a search and, and you get really good at that. Copy and paste in the command line. I usually set up like a um, like a VM when I do it, you know, in a hypervisor so I can, uh, you know, do multiple uh, layers and things like that. It's all good. So, and there, there are actually um, Docker Swarm applications that are just easy enough to where you can literally just type in um, Docker run Docker Swarm. I don't know that it's that easy, but it's very similar. So, you can actually have a working version with a little website <laughs> that pops up and you can configure your, your Swarm, your little nodes and the whole thing. So, pretty cool. All right, that's about all I have.